some reason when I was like doing a lot of drugs, I really liked Emily Dickinson. Interesting. Yeah. Connor, a fan of the show, sent me the new Amen Dune single, Mickey Dora, from the new album Freedom, being released on March 30th. I've been a fan of Amen Dunes for years. Through Donkey Jaw and Love are some of my favorite albums. This was my soundtrack. This was my jam. I listened to Mickey Dora on repeat all day. Then the following day, after hearing it, I thought, this dude reads. So I got in touch with Damon McMahon, the musician behind Amen Dunes, to see if he wanted to come on the show to talk about books. He said he would. As it turns out, he likes books more than music. So the last day of my 28th year, Damon and I met in Greenpoint, Brooklyn for an interview. Damon, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're at McNally J's bookstore. Mm -hmm. We're waiting for coffee and mm -hmm. Lynn flags me. She says, come here. I actually managed to get this on camera, but we're in this bookstore. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think I know this will be. Are they playing it? <laughs> what is it? Is it Mickey Dora? Yeah. I recognize my voice, but I didn't know what song that was. That's hysterical. No, that, yeah, that's actually Mickey Dora. Nice, yeah, they're man. playing it. And I thought, like, what the hell are the odds? You know, so we those, come those up. Are some, those are some slim odds. Seriously. Yeah, so we come up here. Unless they're playing it all day long. Right. <laughs> Which would be rad. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's happening. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. It's a short song, though, so. It is, yeah. Those are, those are some good, you know, slim odds that you'd walk in at that moment. It sure felt like it, yeah. It, mm -hmm. I, I took it as an extremely good omen. In a bookstore. That is a good omen. As we're here to talk, you know, talk about books. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that leads me into basically my first question is, uh, do you have a favorite bookstore here in New York? Um, probably The Strand. The Strand, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like McNally Jackson too, but The Strand is cool. It's uh, really big, used books and like, I don't know, there's more of like a, tra there's a tradition to that place. Mm -hmm. It's very much like a New York staple. It's a little more down to earth. It's like kind of rough around the edges in a way. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of like, that's where like, like an Upper East Side guy, you know, like an older Upper, e upper West Side guy would go to like buy his books or something. Yeah, totally. A totally. bunch of plastic bags and stuff. That, that kind yeah. of vibe. Right. They have the uh, the John Waters thing. If you go home, somebody they don't have books, don't fuck them. I used to say. Oh that. yeah, yeah, that bag. Yeah. I don't think that I, I've seen that bag. I, I don't know if I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> they're good people. They're 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 fuckable people who don't read books. I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've changed my tune <laughs> for sure. It's just something that you realize when you, uh, you get older because yeah. <laughs> of experience. Yeah. This is this is totally appropriate to segue mm. into this next one. What was your favorite book as a kid? Hmm. As a kid, like how old? Let's say not just able to learn to read, but maybe like starting to actually get it, your taste. So maybe 9, mm -hmm. 10, 11 maybe. Huh. That young? I mean, Yeah. I think like in high school, I didn't really have like a favorite book that young. Actually, that, that's not true. I mean like, like, uh, I, I, think, I think I didn't really have a favorite book until high school probably, but I think like, mm -hmm. In early high school, I read like Hemingway for the first time. Yeah, okay. And um, it was the first time like I really appreciated prose and like clean writing and stuff. And yeah. Yeah, it was the first time I experienced like elegant writing. Everything else was sort of awkward and like clunky. Like they would make you read like My Antonia and shit and I don't know. Or like just things that were sort of like summer reading requirements. And Hemingway was the first time it felt like fresh and kind of exciting. Yeah. So that's maybe the first yeah. first author I liked. Do you remember the uh, the specific Hemingway short story or the novel? I or guess was it was it? probably like, you know, Farewell to Arms or For Whom the okay. Bell Tolls or something. That's been coming up a lot recently. Yeah. Yeah, like Brett Easton Ellis, who uh -huh. had a big impact on him. Joan Didion uh -huh. actually, I think, really loved the Farewell to Arms. It's interesting. Everybody, mm. it seems, Hemingway hits a lot of people. He like, does. And, and he continues to. As a person, you know. Yeah. He's not the most like appealing person, or he wasn't the most appealing person. Sure. Least, supposedly, you know. Right. But yeah, his writing is just kind of can't can't fuck with his writing. No, definitely hmm. can't fuck with Hemingway's writing. Yeah. When I first contacted you, I loved your response to agree to do this. It was basically like, you're like, yeah, I'll do the interview. I love books more than I like music. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. Uh, what What made you choose to? write music instead of literature mm, or, or books? I mean, I think 
just because it came very naturally. And I didn't like reading that much until I was a little older. Oh, tell me more. Yeah, I mean, like, I think, actually, that's not really true. I, yeah, when I was in high school, I did like reading, and, when, and I also started writing music in high school. Mm -hmm. But maybe just because music came incredibly naturally to me. Yeah. It's always been effortless. I just, it's some kind of like inborn thing that's just uh, yeah. been kind of given to me. Whereas writing, I love to read, but like I didn't write effortlessly. Right. And I didn't really write like casually for pleasure or anything. Sure. And so I didn't have like any ambition. It was like, it would have been like pretty far-fetched for me to think of being a novelist or something. Sure. You know? Sure. So I think that's probably why. It's interesting you say it was, it was sort of given to you almost, you know, with your, with your lyrics, I read in a few interviews that it was sort of like, it, it, it's not that it wasn't important, but there mm -hmm. was this really, this conscious, unconscious effort of like letting the words match the, the sounds perfectly, you know, and, it, and yeah. it, it wasn't necessarily important that they make coherent total sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think like, I mean, outside of like prose and stuff, but like maybe poetry. Right. You know, not, poetry doesn't like, quote unquote, make sense, you know, I mean, right. I think so. For me, my lyrics um, make a ton of sense abstractly. Right. And there's like very clear intention and there's like clear yeah. meaning abstractly yeah. you know right but uh what was the question exactly oh it, it was it was more of a comment yeah yeah, more, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I um yeah so this the, like for the way i write music is like i feel a certain energy come on yeah i have an instrument normally i'll play chords that feel good and i'll sing a melody on top of those chords mm -hmm. and then that the voice that comes out is like preformed if that makes sense like it's like some melody is just kind of delivered and then I just follow it like you would follow like train tracks or like surfing or something and it just kind of does its thing mm -hmm. and it sounds a little bit like English. Mm -hmm. That's about as close as I can get and then I record it or I, or I think of what it is and then I'll kind of like chase it and write down words that match the sounds mm -hmm. but yeah, they just come, it comes prepackaged. Totally. So that's totally. kind of how I do it. So the lyrics are inevitably going to be abstract because mm -hmm. it comes from some other place. It's like comes from the unconscious mind a little bit. It seems that they are meant to be read, though. For yeah, the, for yeah, they reason. are meant to be read, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I guess because poetry is meant to be sung or right. spoken, you know, and read. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, where sometimes prose is not. Sometimes it's very kind of matter of fact. and Exactly, like just transmitting information. As yeah, to sort of. Yeah, it can yeah, be yeah. artful and pleasing in different ways, but not yeah. as like heavily artful or, or pleasing as poetry or, or, or song lyrics, so. I do like poetry, but it's not something exactly I go, I go you know, bragging about. Are yeah. you a fan of poetry? Mm, I can't, I can't claim to be like a heavy poetry person. Likewise. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like there's the, the poetry project on St. Mark's Place. I love that place. It's one of like the only cultural, like New York kind of cultural institutions that I really mm -hmm. think is cool. And that community is really cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those people are real poetry. I'm not. I mean, I have some poets that I l really love. But mm -hmm. what was it? What was the community again? Oh, was, um, there's something called the Poetry Project. The Poetry which Project, which Ann Waldman started. Yeah. And um, with someone else probably, but it's on St. Mark's Place in the East Village. And they have readings every week. They have workshops, and then on New Year's Day they have a very famous like 24-hour, I guess, reading. Nice. Where they invite like just tons of people to read and perform and stuff. Oh, that's right. And super New York and yeah pure and pretty pretty great. Do you have any favorite New York writers? New York writers? Yeah. Um, Burroughs or Mailer or... Uh, not so much. Not so much yeah. I, I think Burroughs is amazing as a guy. Sure. He's so fucking cool. Yeah. But I never loved his writing. Yeah, I, I read Naked Lunch. I don't remember a single... Yeah, it yeah. never, never was my thing as much. Right. I mean, I guess you could call like Kerouac like a New York writer. For a period, at least, right? Yeah. yeah. So I think Car when I was a kid, yeah, Kerouac was mind blowing. Yeah, for sure. That was a big deal. Yeah. And then Ginsburg, when I was a kid too, was like right. really pretty amazing. How about like late teens, early twenties? When, when, when um, for well, writers, late teens, early twenties, I was just doing a ton of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so I probably didn't read much more than like street signs, psychedelics, or like, like all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So I wasn't reading a lot, but that, but 
No, that's not totally true. In college, for some reason, when I was like doing a lot of drugs, I really liked Emily Dickinson. Interesting. Yeah, she, I was kind of introduced to her in high school, oh. and then she stayed with me. Yeah. So she's a, my favorite poet, and um, and then I got into like Taoist writing, I guess, a little bit. I used to live in China, and I ended up in China because I was interested in Taoism. And late teens, twenties—that's early twenties—I was reading, you know, some Taoist writing and stuff. Did you ever read the Tibetan Book of the Dead? No. I got that on my list. Oh, yeah. I'd be, yeah. I would be interested yeah. in that. But, yeah, Buddhism, I've never been as much interested in Buddhism. but <laughs> Totally. Um, but, yeah, late teens and 20s is kind of like a void for me. Like, for sure. wasn't reading a lot. Do you have a Taoist text that you would recommend? Yeah, I mean, my favorite guy is this guy Zhuangzi, and he's like, instead of being sort of like poetic, it's more just like short stories. Nice. You know, about people doing stuff like farmers and butterflies and walking around the mountains and stuff. Did you ever read uh, Virgil? No, I've never read Virgil. So there's this one called The Georgics, which is just all about farming. But it's this like oh. amazing piece of poetry. Oh. But it's all just about like interacting with the land. Mm. You know, but it's this massive, like heavy text in cool. a way. Yeah. I've always, been, I've always thought to, it'd be cool to read some Virgil, but I never have. Yeah, yeah. Lisbon. I heard you spent time in Lisbon. I'm a huge fan of uh, Fernando Peshwa, but oh, yeah. it is quiet. You know, I, I thought it would have been uh, necessary for me to check him out while I was there. For sure. And I did buy that book. Yeah. And I couldn't get into it. Really? Yeah, I couldn't get into it. I it's, read like a history of Portugal that was cool. Yeah. But I, I, tried, I couldn't get into him. Yeah. It's very, very bleak and morose. Yeah, it's morose in sort of like a self-focused way. Very, yeah, which very I have, insular. I, yeah, I have trouble with like sort of bitterness in, in fiction and totally. like self-pitying and stuff. Absolutely. I mean, whatever, I mean, more, more, there's more to it than that, but I, there's right. an element of that in his writing that I was just like, eh, it's not my thing totally. I think I would reread it and I would not get uh-huh. nearly as much out of it as I did at a certain time. But I was far more bitter and cynical yeah, yeah. When, I, when I was reading that. Right. And it's an interesting thing that I was going to do a video about is depressing literature hmm. or like cynical or bitter literature. Huh. Um, it's, be, it's, it's tricky. Uh, very, tell yeah, you, tell yeah. me more. Yeah, what do you think about that? I mean, it's like... Is it a good thing? Does it help you at a certain time? And then it's just like later you're like, whoa, that was just like making it worse. Maybe. Or, yeah. I mean, like, with me... I music think, too. Yeah, yeah. Music too. I think if it's if there's too much self in it, it's not successful art. That, that's a kind of bold statement, but to me, it's not satisfying to me if there's too much like self, self in it, self focus, sort of like needy bitterness. That if I if I can like taste that in someone's writing, I'm like turned off. Without a doubt. So, yeah, depressing literature can be great. Right. Negative literature can be great. But it has to have, for me, it has to have some kind of like uplift or sort of like objectivity to it. Totally. You know? And some writers don't, like, I'm not crazy about that Bissot or whatever. And like, Mm -hmm. some like, you know, Philip Roth and stuff. Actually, he can Mm -hmm. be pretty cool. I I read one of his like um, later books that I really liked. Which one? called Every Man or something about death or someone dying. Okay, I'm reading American Pastoral right now. I have never read it. It's, it's interesting. He, he's yeah. obviously an insane writer. Yes, you know, it's very good. I, I tried, so I read the later book and I liked it and I tried to read one of his earlier books and uh-huh. I, just, I don't know, I couldn't get into it as much. It's definitely got like this cynical, like, it's smart in a narrative sense, yeah. but I feel like there are some passages that definitely go f- too far in that direction. It just pulls the, the lever too far. Yeah. It's just too, I mean, Joan Didion's another one. Definitely, yeah. Well, I, it's not really fair because it's like I've only read one of her books. I didn't even finish it. One about going to Central America. Oh, yeah, right. I forget the name of it. Yeah, but yeah I know. What I think they're about. better Joan Didion books, but yeah. that book, I put it down because I, had, I felt that in that book. Right. There was just this, like, just, yeah, it was just sort of cynical and kind of like, glib or something. I don't know. I yeah. wasn't, it doesn't work for me. It seems like it's kind of like declarative. Like it completely shuts off. You don't yeah. need to like take in anything positive. Yeah. You know, it's like, cause you have your, your, you find, you found out how the real world is and it's shit. Yeah. Basically. That's the kind of the attitude. But if there's like a smile in that, like, right. then, then it's cool. Exactly. Right. Like I right. happen to love Charles Bukowski. Yeah. 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 And yeah. like, I remember one point when I was in China, actually, I worked with this guy 
and he was like a big reader, an English guy. And I was, he's like, do you like Picasso? I was like, no, that's fucking like teenage stuff. And he's like, you're wrong. You should really give him a chance. <laughs> and he gave me Post Office. And I saw yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, some of his later writing got a little excessive, but it's like sure. Post Office is very like sublime. Right. And very heartful. Definitely. And compassionate. Definitely. It, plus negative and kind of aggressive and all that stuff. He just walks that fine line, but I, I mean, he's falling over on yeah, either side. Yeah. But I mean, it's... But he's got a lot of love in him. And he's he funny. Does. Yeah. I, I love that guy, man. And he, you hear his interviews, it's so fucking spiritual, actually. He's incredibly spiritual, I think. Yeah, yeah. You ever read Animal Crackers, the short story? Mm-hmm. So That's it, one of his? Dude, I'm, I'm going to, yeah. like, I won't talk about it on camera because I just, it's, I've just talked about it for the yeah. people, but read Animal Crackers and, mm-hmm. and I'm going to send it to you. It has Ooh. the greatest short story ending I've uh, ever, huh. ever read. I will not yeah, spoil yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, his endings are good. Yeah. Yeah, he's, the, he's, he's one of my favorite American writers and he's so good yeah and I mean he's it, it, him talking about writing that he's like oh yeah 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 bim, I've, bim, I've bim, read bim, a lot of his like, yeah man. that's amazing it's so good and that works yeah. for almost all art I don't think too much you know I, I mean that's what I get from that interview he's just like don't be insincere don't try too hard don't be something you're not fucking don't think too much and have some like heart in it and let it be natural. I think that's kind of like, that's what I get from that interview. I love that. Yeah, bim, bim, bim. Yeah. I think writing should be like, yeah, he's like, every sentence should be good or something. Or yeah, like, like yeah. have some point to it and stuff. Yeah, it's yeah. great, man. Man, how do you, it's, it's, it's such an intense balance to try and achieve, you know, where it starts in to. In writing, yeah. Well, in all of it, I imagine, also in music, you know, I mean, especially when you're, when, when performing and, and all these different things. And also with writing too, that state of, if you want to call it flow or whatever, mm-hmm. or you know where it starts to be, the intuitive thing that you're given takes over, and you're not thinking yeah. any longer. The kind of dissolution of self, mm-hmm. instead of like this is what I want to say, and it must yeah, do yeah. this thing for other people. I think it's, it's probably easier with music, but maybe I'm biased because it kind of comes more easily to me. But yeah, I think it'd be easier with music. Yeah, because it's like a simpler art form. It's it's inherently more natural, or it's right. inherently more like innate or something wow. you know what I mean I mean unless you're writing yeah. classical music or you're like fucking modern composition or something right but like songs you right. know like songwriting like yeah. traditional song it's like I don't know I would find it harder to write well like successfully convey that in writing I don't know totally where do you find your books hmm oh, like how do I get info mm-hmm. on them yeah do you take recommendations for friends mm-hmm. or do you look online well or? I for a long time I just read old books yep because, like, they kind of tend to be better. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. those are easy to find. Like, everybody kind of knows about them. Right. And then new books, I I like, like, the London Review of Books. I like the New York Review of Books. Definitely. Yeah, I love those guys. Those two guys are... Paris Review? You know, I don't read it as much. Yeah. Because I was, like, kind of more interested in, like, nonfiction current events for a while. Yeah. And Paris Review is... Or, like, um, yeah, yeah, Paris Review is pretty, you know, there's interviews. fiction. Interviews yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so those like publications, and then good bookstores, you know. Yeah, totally. I'll, I'll go into a, a store that I respect and be like, "What do you guys really like?" And for sure, you know, oh yeah, that's the best. It's normally pretty reliable. Yeah, and then friends, I, I have, I tend to have more writer friends. I don't have a lot of musician friends. Yeah. So they will be like, "Yo, this is really good. Right. Read this. Blah blah blah." But I mean, as far as like books that had a, a tremendous impact on you, and I ask this because mm-hmm. everybody loves to get recommendations. You yeah, know, yeah. Talk about everybody's always looking for something that really had a profound impact uh, on people that they love and respect. Mm -hmm. And I think it's particularly important if you have the suggestions because, because of what we were discussing with depressing literature. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I find myself constantly recommending these books and it's always like kind of a serious bummer. Bummer. Yeah. It's like, Uh it's Hmm. so as far as books that had a really positive impact on Mm, you. Yeah, man. Yeah. There are a bunch. I mean... You have like three? Like yeah, really solid Yeah, yeah. I mean like, yeah. I'd say Virginia Woolf is my favorite writer of all time. Nice. The Waves or To The Lighthouse? Or? Um, to The Lighthouse or to Mrs. Lighthouse. Dalloway or Jacob's Room. Got it. Those three. I mean, she's just fucking insane. She's, she's like the most like heavenly writer I've ever read in my life. Um, and so when I would read her, I would just be like, completely engrossed and completely like submissive almost it's like you kind of enter her 
writing and if you can if you connect with her and like pay attention it's just like it's like master work you know totally it's way beyond anything else almost anything I've ever read so that those books blew my mind yeah and then like um, Brothers K was like yeah mind blowing for sure really, really it's fucked up though I was like reading it on a train in Europe I was like on tour oh yeah and uh, I lost I left it on this fucking train when I had like 30 pages left so I've actually never finished it but what I read was pretty amazing yeah and that, you know, that book, I guess, like, was, the writing was sort of, it was less about, like, the play of the writing. Like, it was less of, of like, majestic, like, kind of, like, playfulness in the writing and more just, like, incredible, like, humanity. And it was very, like, structurally incredible. Like, it was a good translation. And so the writing was all obviously amazing, too, but it was less, like, flowery and just kind of, like, yeah. almost mathematic and... Yeah. And then and Faulkner, you know those. I mean, like, yeah, you dude. know those guys. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, I mean, my favorite writers are the obvious ones, you know. Well, well I mean, but maybe not though. I mean, like, you know, because yeah. m- maybe the Faulkner crowd, I wouldn't necessarily uh, huh. peg for for the the, the Wolf crowd, but huh. I mean, yeah, all the yeah, time. I can see that. But, but I mean, but yeah, you got yeah, the heavyweights. For yeah, sure. he's amazing, man. I mean, oh, like, my God. I mean, particularly like Sound of the Fury. Yeah, just such a beautiful experience. I think the best novels are like. An experience, right, right. Like when you when you go for them and you mm-hmm. like engage with them, it changes your life. It really does. It changes the way you think. I think sort of like cognitively, you find yourself changing and become sharper and more like insightful just by reading these people's books. And so, Sound of the Fury was like so fucking beautiful, man. There's that the ending of that book. It's like it's like all these like they like describe. He like describes like what happened to each character at the end. Mm-hmm. There's like sort of an index of characters and what happened to them in their lives, mm-hmm. and it gets like there are sort of lengthy descriptions until the finer final character. It says like whatever her name was, and it says like she. I, I'm not gonna be able to remember it, but it's like it's like three words, and it just sums the whole book up, and it's just so emotional and amazing. So th- those are like three authors that I would say my favorite. I, gotta say, I read Absalom, Absalom not too long ago. Yeah, it changed my whole shit. Oh yeah, like, that, dude, book's, it was, that book's amazing too. It, and, and everybody said it would, and it yeah. really did. I mean, that's why I do this. And like, why we're talking, like, you yeah, know, like yeah. Just, to, just so maybe this will go out there wherever in the world, and somebody will have their their life turned upside down. Yeah, in a great I, hope way. So. I mean, know. like, yeah, it's like it's the greatest art form. I think. Too. I don't know personally. Yeah. I'm the most impressed by it. Yeah, for you know? sure, for sure. So, favorite sentence. <laughs> Favorite sentence? Yeah. I'm, no pressure on this. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. You know, I was thinking of one sentence that, like, my mom, when I was a kid, mm-hmm. I got a lot of, like, books from my mom. And uh, I was very young. I was probably, like, 13. Mm-hmm. And I was just trying to explore literature. And she was like, there's a book called The Stranger. And she's like, the first sentence is like, my mom or whatever died today or maybe it was yesterday. I can't remember. And that was, I felt, that was like, very... That was impactful when I first heard that. I was like, oh, that's so fucked up and beautiful and like vacant. And it kind of re- reminded me of the feeling I had sort of experienced in like punk rock and like Bob Dylan and rappers. I don't know, it was the first time I, I, I experienced like an outsider energy in literature. But in like stuff that I really loved on my own, I mean, favorite sentence. I, I mean, mean, that's a good one. Though. Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> and the end, of, the end of The Sound and the Fury was, is pretty incredible. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, totally. Uh, any books that uh, really had a heavy, heavy impact or heavily inspired freedom? Hmm. No, I mean, someone else asked me that recently, and it's yeah. like, strangely, I cared. I cared more about these lyrics than any lyrics I've ever written for mm-hmm. an Amy Dunes record. But it just comes from somewhere else. It's like cumulative, I guess. Totally. No, nothing in particular. I, I don't think I was. I was not reading when I was making this record much. Mm-hmm. Only after I finished it. So no, strangely, not really. Yeah, I don't think so. But it's all simple language, right? So it's definitely like poetry in a way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's strong. Thanks, man. I worked really hard on these lyrics. I wanted them to be very like popular culture, sort of. You're killing it. I mean, it's. it's I tried hard to. I mean, like I wanted it to be as simple, like that Bukowski thing. I was like, what's the simplest language I can use to like convey all this stuff, even if it's sort of like tropes or sort of like cliches at times, but like. That, you know, that's my favorite kind of writing, mm-hmm. like clean writing. So I tried to, yeah. I tried to make it clean. Yeah. 
Yeah. If you haven't heard it already, go check out Mickey Dora. You have to immediately. And Freedom comes out on the 30th. In March 30th, yeah. March 30th. Mm -hmm. Tremendous. And you're going on tour with yep. Fleet Foxes. Fleet Foxes for two months, I think. And then we're going to Europe in the middle of that. Man. Busy. And then, tour, yeah, and then it continues then. Yeah. A little break in June, July, and then we start touring again August, September, November, nice. end of the year. So. Excellent. I'm reading Orlando right now. Oh, you are? Cool. Orlando I've never read it. Oh, yeah. oh, I just seen the movie. The oh, movie's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was insane. It's very yeah. interesting. Just I insane. bet. It's just so yeah. She's, yeah, she's insane. Yeah. She's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. I have to read that one. How about uh, a books? A book, or mm -hmm. maybe a couple of books. That made you uh, laugh, cry, or both. And it may be mm. the ones that you already already mentioned. But. Yeah, I mean, crime definitely, when I finished Jacob's Room, like, I think he, you know, he dies at the end. There's like a sentence about his shoes in the floor. I remember like, fucking closing that book, that reading the last page and just starting cr start crying. Dude, it's amazing. Yeah, it's so happens. amazing. Yeah. And then, like, from like the profundity of it, like, yeah, reading people like Faulkner or Proust, like I remember reading like, um, Remembrance of Things Past and I remember like crying on the, pl the 14th Street, you know, pl subway platform, just like reading those pages about music, just so profound. Yeah. So those are, those are books that made me cry. Laugh, um, there's a writer that this guy Paul Betty who wrote a book called The Sellout last year. Mm -hmm. So good, nice. so fucking good. He made me laugh out loud. He's so funny and so profound. That's a great book. The, the Sellout. The Sellout. Yeah, the sellout. yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I've been reading more like contemporary writers. And yeah, I've been making an effort too. Yeah. But it's it's, it's tough when this. It's tough, so man. But that one thing. is pretty. That one's pretty good. Pretty sellout. pretty amazing. All right, man. So these albums through Donkey Jaw and Love have been the soundtrack for so many important moments in my wife and I's you know, lives for the last few years. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know if there was a story behind uh, Baba Yaga mm -hmm. off through Donkey Jaw. Well, um, I wrote that in the summer of 2006. I was living in Chelsea in a sublet and uh, it was like in the evening and um, that song just like came to me. I kind of had that fingering pattern, you know, on the guitar. Yeah. And I just, um, it was one of those just like delivery songs, like if you plug in the chord, it'll just fucking get delivered to you in, t in total, you know what I mean? Like I got like a completed song that just kind of came. I probably wrote it for 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and I was done. And uh, yeah, and I think that song, and those words came to me. You say, you say that I'm negative, but you know it's all made up. Mm -hmm. You know that a song, let it be soft. You know that I lie, I girls in motion. Yeah, it's just about like, it's just about like lust and like negativity and empowerment. I think like that was a period of my life. That, that through Donkey Dog Records, pretty negative, pretty dark. That and the DIA one are pretty dark and mm. just empowerment through your like shadow self. Totally. That's, that whole record is kind of about that. And it's sort of emotional like release and sort of like, it's sort of like I found that the darkness pacifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what that song is about. I don't really play that one much anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Un understandably, but yeah. I mean, it's so. What were we were talking about, you've been to Joshua Tree, we mm -hmm. were in Joshua Tree. It's expansive, it reminds me of a desert. I went to mm. the Sahara once in uh -huh. Baba Yaga, that's what it sounded like. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. It's, it's not necessarily evil, it's just mm -hmm. bigger and it's kind of other. It is and, very other. You know, and I think I was, you know, some sort of like spirit or something was singing through me with that one. Totally. Read any young, young hmm. or anything like that? Carly? Not really. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. 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 I'm, I, I haven't either. I'm just getting into it. But I'm curious. There's a lot of that exploring the shadow self, yeah. the whole concept, and uh, totally. I wrote him off for so long, but mm. it was only recently that I was like, well, no, I got it. I, I should have an, uh, an informed opinion. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> it's know? important to get to anywhere else you want to get to to like engage with that part of yourself. Definitely. You know, you can't you can't stuff it down. It'll pop up eventually. You're dropping a lot of words of wisdom. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't make any of it up. I just I guess I read a lot of books. Yeah. <laughs> there it is, man. <laughs> Damon, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having it's, me. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to meet you. All right. Freedom, March 30th. Check it out. Mickey Dora and Blue Rose. And Blue Rose, yep. Yeah.
killer. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good night. The place we did the interview turned out to be right next door to where he had written some of his previous music. I had no idea. It seemed like a coincidence. But the older I get, the less I believe in coincidence. Oh, no.